morning. The reading today comes from 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. Nathan rebu- rebukes David. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised the little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to, said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. Well, good morning. Uh, Before I forget, if you're planning on uh, turning up to the uh, baptismal service tonight, please bring a plate of food to share. Now, if you don't know me, my name's Jared. I'm one of the many sons that Steve had. He's a bit like Father Abraham, didn't know when to stop. (laughs) But I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your support for my family and I over this past year. I haven't been up here preaching for over a year now. Um, and at the start of the year, we accepted a pastoral role down in Ipswich and uh, it was pretty quick. So there wasn't any chance to say goodbye or anything like that. Um, and basically as quickly as it started, it ended that quickly. So it's been a rough year for us. Um, and for those of you who've been around and supported us, I just wanted to say thank you. So I understand, can you hear me all right? Beautiful. I understand that this year we've been slowly working through the Old Testament. And when I say slowly, we haven't been going verse by verse because that would probably take us about six years. We've been ju- slowly but surely just jumping to different passages that have been uh, poignant or important ones. And so Dad mentioned to me that today I'd be looking at Second Samuel 1 verses 12, and I thought, all right, I want to finish that with Psalm 51. So I mentioned that to him, and he says, no. I'm talking about that next week. (laughs) So you'll have to come back for part two. So then I start thinking through my mind how I'm going to go about this sermon and I come up with a plan and then two weeks ago, Miles pretty much did my exact sermon. (sighs) So this is part three. (laughs) All right. Before we begin today, will you join me, join with me in prayer? Father, there are a lot of things going on in our world at the moment, things that are hard to deal with. And Lord, this morning we come to your word and we we ask that you will speak, that you will change us and that you will grow us. Help us to be open to your leading and to your guiding so that we may become closer and closer to the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So this morning, when I'm talking about King David, I think it's important to actually provide some context. So I'm going to go right back to the beginning of time, back to the beginning of the grand old story that we call the Bible. In the beginning, specifically the first two chapters, we have the creation story. Now, everyone who reads the creation story has a different interpretation. Was it 24 hours? Was it exactly that? Were each of the days a little bit longer? But I think irrespective of the way that you interpret it, the way that every biblical scholar believes is that God created order and he created the world with design and a purpose. There's specific rules in place. If you drop an apple, it's always going to fall to the ground. But the culmination of creation story was humanity. So I'm going to take us back to Genesis 1. Looking, at, looking from verse 26. And then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them. The reason I'm bringing this up is, what is our purpose as humans? Well, it's quite simple, really. God created us in his image. We are designed to be image bearers. And the way I like to describe that is the idea of a mirror. When you look at a mirror, what do you see? Some of you might be happy with what you see, some not. But it really depends on the angle that you look at the mirror. You might see yourself, you might see a wall. If the mirror is in your living room, you might see, a, it basically will just extend the space almost. It'll make your room feel bigger. So the purpose of a mirror is that it reflects. And if we think about that in our light, as image bearers, our purpose is to bear something, to reflect something or someone. And so when we were created, We were designed to perfectly reflect God to everything and everyone around us. Now, as we know, the fall happened. We sinned and we fell short and all of a sudden, we no longer bear God's reflection perfectly. Often, we reflect just ourselves. And that's where I'm starting today, this morning's talk. The Bible then follows from that It follows Adam and Eve down the generations. As humanity falls further from God, he reveals himself. He wants to return humanity to himself. It's called the grand old redemption story. Through the flood, he reveals his intolerance of evil. God is holy. And through the Tower of Babel, or Babel, however you wish to pronounce it, he reveals that humanity elevating themselves to God is not possible. He's set apart. He's different to us. There's a clear separation between us. And then Abraham comes along. And what do we remember Abraham for? He's a man of great faith. When God created and entered a covenant with him, he used a general means that was understood in the culture back that day to to build relationship with Abraham. He promised that he will make that nation great. He'll have lots of children. And he will use the nation of Abraham to redeem humanity. Abraham didn't do anything to deserve that. It was a gift of God. And then we come down the line to the giving of the law. And again, the giving of the law, it's a very similar law code to other law codes that were out there in that day. You might have heard of the law code of Hammurabi. But the beauty of the law, again, was in its difference. And God revealed, quite simply... The way that Jesus, I'll rephrase that, the difference is summed up in the way that Jesus summed up the law. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and to love your neighbour as yourself. And so as Miles mentioned two weeks ago, the nation of Israel was designed to be a theocracy. What does that mean? It means that God was meant to be the head of it. People were meant to look to God for leadership, for guidance, what they were to do in life but they rejected God by asking for a king. 
I can understand and appreciate why. A king seems easier to follow, someone you can physically see, but it doesn't make it right. And King Saul initially was good. He led the people towards God and honoured God and glorified God, but it didn't last. And eventually God rejected him. And King David was anointed as king. And so that comes towards the text today where we find ourselves in 2 Samuel 1. The important part for this text is noticing what David did beforehand. Now he's remembered as the man after God's own heart, but he failed. And we read in 2 Samuel 11, I'm not going to actually read the full text because we go through, we've gone through a lot this morning already. I'll just paraphrase. There's basically a time when kings would go to war with their armies and for an unknown reason, King David remained behind. One afternoon, he looked out from his balcony and he saw a woman bathing. Interested in her, he got her up into his room and he slept with her. She fell pregnant and this lady, Bathsheba, she was Uriah's wife. Now, Uriah was one of David's mighty men, a man of renown for incredible deeds on the battlefield And to cover up his sin, David pulled Uriah away from the battle and brought him home. Of course, Uriah wouldn't sleep with Bathsheba though, not while his mates were still in battle. And so David then sent him to the front lines of the battle where he was killed. Quickly, David then married Bathsheba, hoping to sweep this entire thing under the rug. Surely no one noticed. And David tried to continue as though nothing had changed and nothing had gone on. But what David did displeased God. And so we come to the text today. So 2 Samuel 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There was two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had brought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveller to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. David was infuriated with the man, And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity, he must pay four lambs for that lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. just lost my place sorry i anointed you king over israel and i delivered you out of the hand of saul and i gave you your master's house and your master's wives into the arms and gave you the house of israel and judah and if this were too little i would add to you as much more why have you despised the word of the lord to do what is evil in his sight you have struck down uriah the hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take up your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. 
I really struggle with this passage. In many ways, I don't know what to do with it. It's quite confronting. And yes, David is spared, and that is gracious and merciful of God. But why does the child have to die? I work in the funeral industry. Just started relatively uh, not too long ago. Most of the people that we meet and that we care for have lived a long and fruitful life. And whilst there is still often a sense of grief, there's often a sense of thanks for the life and the time that we had with these people. But of course, when it's a child, it's completely different. It can be quite traumatic. And the grief is devastating. If this is confronting for you, I'm truly sorry, but it's part of the text that we need to hit this morning. And if you may not have lost a child yourself, I guarantee there's been other suffering and other trauma in your life. And why does God allow that? Why does that happen? Isn't God supposed to be a good God? Shouldn't he do good things for us? If he allows evil to happen, does that question his goodness? And this is where we come to what is called the problem of evil. If any of you have read much C.S. Lewis from last century, you might have read the book Problem of Pain. He summarises a similar sort of ideal. But the problem of evil is a philosophical proposition which was in the realm of theology and discusses the sovereignty and goodness of God. Is he truly good? Dates back to the 1700s and Epicurus summarised it in this way. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence cometh evil is he neither able nor willing then why call him god and the logic flows if god is all powerful which we christians believe that could he not create a world where evil did not exist where pain and suffering did not exist because evil exists and due to our biblical belief that god is one all-knowing Two, all-powerful, and three, morally perfect. It follows that the God we know doesn't exist. And in the centuries that followed, theologians fumbled across different, different answers. And it ultimately came to a head last century when theologians remembered that free will exists. There's a bloke by the name of Alvin Plantinger. He came around... And he said that God is all-powerful, and we believe that. If free will and a lack of pain could not coexist, don't you think that God would have made such a world? It's not that God is not fully sovereign. It follows that for free will to be free will, there must be the possibility for us to choose evil. Now, when we meet people that are struggling... We don't provide theological arguments such as this as to prove God's goodness and existence. We ought not to say his ways are higher than our ways. We ought not to say that God will make good out of this. What it requires is something a little bit more gentle. The same theologian, Alvin Plantinger, proposed the following, and I agree with him wholeheartedly. Such a problem calls not for philosophical enlightenment, but for pastoral care. In the Old Testament, Job and his mates, his mates didn't provide the pastoral care that he needed. They accused him. They questioned him. How about we just provide a listening ear for the people in our lives that are struggling? And just be there. Open a space for them to actually speak with God and find 
what's going on and find the answer in God and not in ourselves. Do I have the answer for why God allowed the death of King David's son? No. Do I have the answer for why God allowed your suffering, whatever that might be? No. But I do know that one day we can ask him. Returning to Genesis, God created us with an intended purpose. It was to reflect God's image. We are image bearers. It was to reflect God's glory to all that is around us. And he designed us with the capacity for us to choose to follow our purpose or to reject it. In our moments of pain, perhaps it is due to our own sin, perhaps it's not. God always confronts us with his word to challenge us. Now that may be with a prophet like Nathan. It may also, it may not be. It may be through the biblical word, through preaching. In John 1 we read, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And John continues later from verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was there at the dawn of time. He was the agent through which creation occurred. Now, unlike King David, who wasn't able to fully reflect the glory and the image of God, we have a king who was. And that's not because he was a man and just didn't sin, but it's because he actually was God. Our God came and dwelt among us, still contained his complete godness, his divinity, but he was also fully human as well. And so he knows the suffering that we go through. He knows the pain that we experience, the trauma that we go through. And that's a beautiful thought. We have a God who understands. I'm going to read from Romans 5. From verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come from verse 18 so then as though one trespass there is condemnation for everyone so also through one righteous act there is life-giving justification for everyone for just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners so also through one man's obedience the many will be made righteous the law came along to multiply the trespass but where sin multiplied Grace multiplied even more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God himself, through the Son Jesus, upheld his own righteousness, but through Christ also opened the door for our justification and our return to our purpose, not to image bear ourselves, but to image and to reflect the image of God to all around us. He's continually following us. Sometimes you might hear him through the still and small voice. Other times through the confrontation of a prophet like Nathan, but his heart is towards our return to him, his redemption. And when we come to the end of our days, 
When we see Jesus face to face, we'll hear one of the two following things. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Or depart from me, for I never knew you. I don't know what's going on in your life at the moment. But I know that God does. And I trust that God is in control. And will, in the grand scheme of things, work all things for the good of those who know, follow and trust his son. And that's been my personal experience and my personal story. Do you know him this morning?